faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird brain. It's a plane. It's I, Walter. I, Walter. Yes, it's I, Walter. Strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. I, Walter, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend ears with his annoying voice, and who disguised as Walter Interanti, mild-mannered janitor for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, nonsense, and the American way. And now, another exciting episode in the adventures of I, Walter. Hey, everyone, this is Walter from I, Walter. I haven't done... Well, is that their correct word? Probably not done. I haven't recorded a video podcast in I don't know how long. It's probably been at least at least a month. Most likely, it's probably been actually even longer. So, Walter, why are you doing one today? Well, that's a good question. There is an answer to that, too. I actually started watching, I think, about a month ago, maybe a little longer than that. Well, actually, it was longer than that. It was about a couple months ago, after I met Kevin Sorbo, I started taking an interest in Kevin Sorbo's, uh, uh, God, I'm sorry about that, I'm already using the word, uh, but yeah, I was I was intrigued by Kevin uh, Sorbo enough to start watching his show Andromeda, and I talked about that after, as I was watching it when I was done. Then after I was when I was finished watching that whole entire program, I was like, you know what? I want to see what else Kevin Sorbo did. Well, obviously it was Hercules. So I end up buying that a while back used, not brand new, and it was pretty fairly cheap. Um, it was actually really cheap. So I, I end up buying that uh, used on Amazon. Somebody wanted to unload their copies of of Kevin Sorbo's show. So I ended up watching all of that and was like, wow, this is interesting. It's not as good as Andromeda, but it was really good. Well, there was a, a, a spinoff from Hercules right off the bat, and it was with Lucy Lawless, and it was Xena. So it was like, you know what? I kind of am curious about Xena. I never really had taken any interest in the show when it was on years ago on, I think, the USA Network. So actually like paying attention to it and understanding where they were going with that show i i actually gave it a chance and hercules was a little bit difficult to get through but xena was actually really caught my attention so i ended up getting that i think i bought it from england on dvd because it was much cheaper and i got the whole series now i had it on hulu but the problem with Hulu is um, your is your internet connection. I had I have an excellent internet connection, or at least I used to. We have at the house Verizon FiOS. Well, that actually slowed down tremendously. So I was getting like this washed out, grainy picture all the time, and sometimes I even lost the signal because the problem is they've overdeveloped where I live, the area where which in uh, where I live, the area has so many people linked on to either Comcast or Fios that even if you have broadband, it's getting kind of watered down by all the people that are on the same um, line as you are. Now, it's, believe it or not, that I believe it does slow you down. So, I mean, it depends what you get um, or, you know, you're, you're watching. Because, like, if you stream iTunes, I relatively never have a problem with iTunes. Somehow, I, I think it's with your compression rate as well. You know, that's one thing I can say because I, I, ha- I don't have much to say good about Apple lately anyway. I do use their products because they're much more user-friendly, which is true. Um, everything I have owned in the past 10 years, at least, has been Apple. So I'm pretty much married to Apple, and it's very difficult to find any other platform that does what Apple does. So anyway, um, yeah, so I did try to watch it on Hulu and was like, wow, this looks really crappy on Hulu. And I actually paid for the service. I am paying for the service. I dropped every streaming service I had. I had about four or five of them. Now I'm down to two. And um, it was Hulu and it is at this point, it's Hulu and um, Amazon because Amazon 
you pay for because I got uh, Prime. So actually, it's three. I apologize. So it's Amazon, which I get for you know as part of my, you know, because I do a lot of shopping on Amazon. So Prime comes with uh, the video streaming for free. So that's number one, and it's Netflix, and then it's Hulu. So technically, it's only really two uh, media kind of things or whatever you want to call it with entertainment. The Amazon just gives it as a perk. And trust me, whatever you pay for Amazon during the course of a year, because I think they charge you the membership. Uh, the membership went over a hundred dollars. Now, I get that back in the course of a year on what I save on shipping costs and even getting stuff store bought at a cheaper price online and having delivered right to my doorstep. And they do deliver it to your doorstep, not sometimes in the mailbox, but give or take. So, um, yeah, so Xena was worth it. It was like, you know what? Did I just waste my money getting Xena? Am I going to really watch this? Because over the years, while I was still working, and I can say that, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff I bought and I start watching and I never end up finishing most of the things I bought over the years. Believe it or not, Xena was one I just basically was determined to do it for, you know, the reason of, okay, I'm going to finish something out that I've actually purchased. And two, because it was really good. So I did actually finish the very last episode. I think I had nine episodes to go as of yesterday, and I finished all nine episodes in one day. So, yeah, I basically marathoned the last remainder of Xena yesterday, and it was worth it. It really was because it was really good. The last episode I know – was a bit of a disappointment for many, and I'd have to agree with that. It was interesting, though. But, um, you know, the show was it was a good, solid six years. Hercules was on for a good six years, but technically it was really only five because the sixth year, as it started, it looked like to me that Sorbo was actually already picked up for Andromeda, and he was the main character. In fact, he came back for a cameo on um, in Xena, as Hercules, and they made the joke of like, boy, your hair is really short now. You know, you, you cut your hair shorter. And that's like, yeah, because you're already working on another show. Now, the weird thing is um, Hercules for him, for Kevin Sorbo, they got to they travel because it was him and this Michael Hurst who actually did, I think, two appearances on the show um, after Hercules was done. Michael Hurst played Hercules' best friend on Hercules, but uh, on Xena... He just kind of randomly appeared as different characters or whatever, Michael Hurst. But for them to do that, because um, I know for a fact that um, Kevin Sorbo actually had to travel when he was doing um, Andromeda, especially that that was filmed in 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 Canada. And Xena and Hercules, both those shows were shot in New Zealand. Now I finally sat down; I had no clue where New Zealand was. I just noticed that they have the same accent as Australia, and obviously they're an English um, col- colony. Is that what you call it? An English-speaking um, country, at least say that way. That word I can say correctly. And then I looked. I was like, "Well, New Zealand's on the tail end of Australia, so it's pretty much part of of the same, um, not the same landscape, but it's right next door to." Australia, so that makes a lot of sense. But anyway, yeah, so Kevin Sorbo, just even for that one show that he came in, came back as Hercules, you know, if you're working on um, Andromeda and you're all the way out on the outskirts somewhere in Canada you and you're travel all the way to New Zealand, that's that's a hike. That's a really big hike. So they probably had to pay him pretty well to do that. So that's funny. One time I did look up, and believe it or not, uh, Lucy Lawless, her net worth is like twice the amount of, of Kevin Sorbo's. And it, it's it's like you can see it for yourself if you look online. I did. So, um, yeah, I wanted to do a dedicated show after I was done watching a series of Xena because I really got into it. I thought it was really good. Um, just to basically maybe kind of highlight that, make a podcast. And, God, I can't even do it because I didn't bother to pull any stories. But I also wanted to speak about, because I went with a friend um, to see, because I, I heard about it on Ken Matthews. I went and seen had seen the movie over the weekend. I think it was Saturday night, me and a friend. We went and seen um, 
um, Death of a Nation. Now, that movie really intrigued me. Um, it really, it was, to me, it was so informative. You know, it had so much information, I should say, so much to get, uh, offer to the audience members or people who want to learn about what's going on in our country and how, you know, he compared it, um, Dinesh. I'm going to say this, and I know I'm going to say it wrong, but I'm going to try anyway. Dinesh, Dinesh Sasusa, he actually um, does a very good job. It's based upon, it looked like two of his books. Generally, it's based upon um, one source of information, one book. This time, I think it was based upon two different books. That's what it looked like to me. Now, the movie didn't make a whole heck of a lot of money. I told this a friend of mine this. His movie actually only made uh, $2.4 million. Well, that's not a lot of money. Well, Dinesh makes films that are more like documentary, I believe, factual films, because he does do a lot of research. So um, his other film that did fairly well, considering, was Hillary's America. Well, that made $4 million. So it was a little bit less than half. I mean, a little bit more than half that he made on this new film. And plus, it only came out um, this past Friday, so that's only three days. What do you expect this to be a blockbuster, a blockbuster smash after three days? I seriously doubt it. And they're comparing just to give it such a bad uh, coverage on his film. They're saying, "Well, this film has a lot, a long way to go to make up what uh, Hillary's America made." Well, Hil- Hillary's America was out for quite a few weeks. It was during election time, which actually did grab more people's attention because they wanted to see they they assumed this because i did and i'm sure other people did they they assumed that this film was like supporting hillary which it was doing the complete opposite because dinesh is a very ultra conservative from india originally he's an american now he's an american citizen he's been for for a long time now but yeah so i think that's what helped out his film people misunderstood what his his um his tactic was except a few of us and the the ones who understood or I understood after the fact after I saw the film or a friend told me about this film um it was like this really helped make him a little bit more money on his his film now the thing was um this is the first time I've ever noticed this with any film because I I check for um reviews on movies And for the last so many years, maybe like the last two years, maybe less than that, I've actually kind of focused on looking at reviews on Rotten Tomatoes because they're pretty, you know, straightforward and they generally steer you in the right direction. So I did this with Dinesh's film. I decided like, okay, let me see what kind of ratings, um, you know, Dinesh's film got on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, got a zero. It got a zero. No film I've ever seen that I've ever view, um, you know, checked for the ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. I've never seen one with a zero. So um, that was harsh. That was really harsh. So it definitely got my attention. Like, I got to check out why they rated this film so bad. And I could not find anything wrong. I found it to be very... Um, a lot of facts, a lot of factual information, which he he seemed to you know present in Hillary's America. Um, Hillary's America. He had two other films out before that. So, but that's what really pissed off because the people who write these reviews don't like Trump, and they're very ultra left wing. I guess I can put uh, liberals who don't like the fact that Dinesh is basically throwing back in their face what they've been throwing for the last year and a half at Trump's face. And that basically is they, you know, keep on calling Trump, meaning the media, the press, the news people, and um, any type of media source have been calling uh, Trump a Nazi, the next coming of Hitler, and um, the most negative things, saying he's, um, he's, uh, he's, um, you know, he treats women like dirt, almost like he's a misogynist. He is, you know, he's he he um, has. Um, I'm trying to think of the right word. He's 
He fools around a lot of young women and stuff like that. All this stuff that every time they throw this in his face, it basically just backfires. So Dinesh just takes it, I believe, the next step where he finds facts on um, the Democrat Party. He actually finds, you know, stuff that he's done. You know, he has found research, which you can find, I believe, he said, it says at the end of the film, you can find his sources, you know, his, um, what do you call it, works uh, sites and his works cited information and his his sources of information, where he got them. You can find them on his webpage. Well, um, the thing that's kind of funny is, you know, and I did do a little research after I, I saw it because one person he brought up was George Soros. And I hear that name constantly on a lot of the the conservative talk shows I listen to, which at this point it's only two. But I always I've heard for a while about George Soros. And George Soros was from Hungary. He was a Jew. And um some some Nazi uh official, I don't know, I'm not too using the right terminology, had taken Soros under his wing and it said, oh, he's 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 Christian. He's not he's not Jewish. And um, Soros went along with it just to save his own tail, which I, I don't know. Maybe other people would do this. And he basically collected the goods off of the Jews who got um, thrown out of their homes or that were executed. He basically he profited on that from the age of 17 until now. And he is now one of the richest men in the in the world. He's worth, I think I saw somewhere, like something like I don't have in front of me, a number of like $18 billion. So he is one of the richest people in the world. And he's an atheist now. So that man is like extremely ruthless and evil. And he pretty much threw his own... Um, you know, his own people in so many words or less under the bus just for his own to save his own hide and to profit off of it. But if you watch the film, which I do recommend to a lot of people of Dinesh's um, Death of America, he does point out a lot of things that it was pretty, um, pretty interesting to me that I really never knew, such as that Hitler was influenced on how to make a socialist society off of America's, the the American Democratic Party. Now, again, I could be, because I've said this before, that's why I'm using the word, again, I've mentioned this to my friend Matt, that if you watch this film, he said that um, he was very, you know, pretty much that Hitler, Adolf Hitler, was intrigued by what he had seen with the Democratic Party and how, you know, pretty much their corruption um, has made them successful. Even back in 1940-something, or was it, I guess it was 1942, I believe, because I don't have this information in front of me. It was probably when World War II was at its worst. That's when I think it almost would have hit the U.S. soil. Or was it 1948? I think it was 1942. I don't remember right off the top of my head. But, yeah, a lot of it pushed that these people who keep on accusing Trump as being a left, I mean, as being a socialist and as being um, the, the the next coming of, of the Antichrist, pretty much um, Dinesh kind of turned it, twisted that around and faced it and, and pointed it at the Democrats of doing everything, like everything – what I just mentioned is not probably the best thing that to d- describe Dinesh's film. But the bottom line is that Dinesh pointed everything back at, at the media and at the Democrats. And he basically did say that Trump is the second best thing since President Reagan as far as making large movements. You know, I mean, not movements, but large changes. Because that, that other word would not seem appropriate so if you think about it who was the one responsible i believe to get the berlin wall torn down and you know stop the division in germany that was 
during Reagan's time. So was that coincidental? I don't think so. It was also Margaret Thatcher, who was also a strong supporter, a very stern prime minister at the time. But, you know, it was it was two people in this whole this whole globe, this, this you know, where we live or whatever this of Earth who actually had made a major two people made a major, major change. They at least influenced it. You can say, well, it was other people. It wasn't just those two. Well, they influenced others to make major changes. Now, look, uh, Trump, he actually did um, sit down and talk to, what is it? Um, I can't remember his name. I apologize. But the head of, of Russia, which they keep on saying he's, you know, coinciding with the Russians, which I know that's a bunch of nonsense from a bunch of overgrown children who know no better. And then he talks to, um, what do you call it, um, from, I want to say Red China. I should look this stuff up, but you know what? As my friend Matt said, you know, it would just be reinstating something that you already know about. So the bottom line is that he's talking to, uh, has spoken to, Trump has spoken to um, government officials in countries that we haven't been able to speak to ever. We have never made any, um, you know, at least Obama never did. Not to the extent that Trump has. So to me, that's kind of pretty interesting that he's been able to break through um, um, through to people in these other foreign countries that we consider our enemies um, and, and actually sit down and negotiate with these people. So to me, that means a lot. And the only other person who actually could get close to doing that would probably be President Reagan, I would assume. So um, make no mistake of that one. So anyway, I just wanted to get that in. If you have not seen it yet, I I told my one friend, Matt, I said I'd be tempted to go see the film again because I use this thing called Movie Pass, and they've changed the way it works. Like Movie Pass... You, you paid like $10 a month. And you could see as many films as you want as many times. So you could see the same film originally like 30 times in one month. Now they stopped that. Then they said you could see any movie at prime time, but you just can't see them in 3D, which that was always the case. Then they've changed that. Now they won't let you see a film that is on open and night, which they did before. Now they stopped that. And if it's during the weekend where, you know, the ticket sales are going to be a lot higher than during the weekdays. They stopped that too, this movie pass. So I end up having to pay for that movie. So the bottom line is um, I still can use my movie pass during the week anytime I want or feel like, like I want to go again. But I do want to see that Dinesh film again of, of Death of America simply because there was so much in there. I started falling asleep because I was just being overwhelmed with like facts and I did look up the one, like I said, on George Soros. I was like, okay, let me just take one grain of Dinesh's film and see if he is correct on what he's um, what he's saying. And he was. He was 100% correct. So, you know, obviously, it, I'm sure, and I, I would believe that a lot of stuff that he was presenting was true. Now, one thing I, I said to a couple friends, never heard back from any of them, was that people, when they talk about American slavery, all they talk about was it was only with African Americans. And I've said this for a while. I learned this actually from all of what I want to go back to, is the show Xena, was that slavery was just not with blacks or quote-unquote African Americans. I say blacks because there was other countries that, had slavery way before 250 years ago or whatever it was in the U.S. Slavery has been around for centuries. It's not something that just came about because of Americans. No, that's been around for for centuries. So, and, you know, no offense to other country or other people, but slavery was more than just, quote-unquote, African-Americans in the U.S. No, and even in the U.S., there were white slaves. You know, there wasn't just black slaves, but that's all you hear about. 
And I personally think that people who believe they're victimized or not are mistreated, this goes back probably not as far as 250 years ago, not saying that it did exist or it wasn't um, noted, but I think what really stirred up people believing being victimized if they were quote unquote African Americans, this really got out of control, I think, after that mini series from years ago of roots. That's the thing that really stirred up um, at, you know, quote unquote African Americans. I really think that started, in my opinion, when that movie Roots came out. Then all of a sudden, people are saying, well, see this? It was the black um, heritage pe- uh, people that were um, from black descent or from African descent that were mistreated. And I'm not, I'm not downplaying it. Yeah, that did happen. But that's only a fraction of what happened. You know, it's like when you want to prove a point and you only basically tell the facts that support your point and just basically, you know, omit everything else that was factual. You know, you just basically focus on the points that you're trying to um, you're trying to uh, make other people listen to. And that's another thing. Now, I'm not these are two different things, but I remember something and I couldn't look for a quote. The Dinesh moved in his film, which means obviously I misunderstood it or I'm not getting it. Not even that I didn't misunderstood it. I did understand what he was saying. But he started off, Dinesh started off his film with Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun when they commit suicide. And his speculation was after they committed suicide, because nobody knows what happened to either one of them. He believes, according to his um, his percep- you know, perceptive view in the film, is that the SS, you know, the Third Reich, had taken the bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun and burned them and, you know, put them in a a shallow grave, which nobody knows where his remains are. You know, because there was this belief that, oh, well, Adolf Hitler could still be alive today. Nobody knows. But so that was just a speculation. But one thing he said that I forget where Hitler was, Adolf was uh, influenced by, with this by, but he, he probably learned this. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong on this is one of the things he learned from the democratic party in U S is something on the line of you can, if you continue to tell a lie and you tell the same lie over and over again, that eventually if you tell the same lie to the, to the public, eventually they're going to believe it. Now, I'm not saying that the correct way. I'm, I'm kind of just paraphrasing. Well, this is, just, this is what I believe, and I'm going to go back to the thing with Roots. And some other history piece movies and stuff that are based upon what happened in American history. Well, you know, and they've, I think they've done this recently with some, was it a movie or a play? And I can't remember the name of it. Um, yeah, I'm drawing a blank. Where they distort the truth and they they turn it into what they want you to believe, what they want you to see. Now, one was that pops up in both of Dinesh's films is Birth of a Nation, not Death of a Nation, but Birth of a Nation, which was made by the Democrats. Um, and it basically was highlighting um, how the, the importance. Now, again, I'm not doing a very good job the importance of the Ku Klux Klan who which which was um you know it derived or was it was born out of the Democratic Party was um was the Ku Klux Klan and um they were you know it was the Democrats originally who were looked down upon African Americans but yet they get most of their support from that side, or at least they used to. And even um, the thing with Planned Parenthood, that came out of the Democratic Party. And what was that for? If I remember correctly, I think I think Matt might have told me this, or I heard this on the radio show. The purpose of um, Planned Parenthood was a way of decreasing the African-American population. It was a way of keeping it down. 
was Planned Parenthood, which the Democrats made. So I didn't want to go this far with it. I actually wanted to talk a little bit more about the Xena show. But all you ever hear from the Democrat side, or at least what they fill your head with, which I think is a bunch of nonsense, is how the Democrats are for the people, which they're not. They try to keep people um, in poverty at a poverty level because that way, if you keep people um, needing help from the, the from the government, and you have large government, which the Democrats believe in, and they they say the opposite, which is not true. They want they say we want smaller government or they they convince you, I should say, you need larger government. No, then that's the thing. Republicans believe in small government and that everybody should be treated equally. You won't hear that from the Democrat side. You won't even hear that from the news, the media or the press. It's just it's just the way it's always been. So but for some reason, people are still convinced. And why do you think that? The Democrats want open borders because open borders mean more people from other countries who have nothing coming into this country. They don't care who they are. They don't even care what their background is. If they're, you know, are some type of coalition or some type of terrorist or are sex offenders, they don't care. All they care about is, well, this is going to mean more votes for us because these people that come in from other countries, no matter where they are, are people that their country, that these these undocumented immigrants are coming from, that their country does not want them in their, you know, they don't want them. They don't want these people. And these people flee. I mean, there is that um, collection of people who come to this country because they themselves want to better themselves. But there's, you know they want they want to become something more than um, just dependent on their government. They want they want to improve their lifestyle. They want to you know become American citizens. But there is so many though coming in our country that ex- you know basically they come here because they're escaping from their country because they are they're um, I'm trying to they're like fugitives. And there's so many of them out there that are fugitives, they're they're dangerous, and they're coming to this country. The Democrats don't want to see that. They they kind of uh, lean, uh, lean a blind eye to these facts. They know it's true, though. And they encourage these people, such as these, these kind of fugitives, to come to our country by offering them free welfare, free medical, free housing. Um, you know, all we ask in return is we're going to make sure that you're going to be able to vote because it's only fair that if you live in our country, no matter how you got here, you should be able to vote and you should be able to have a license because in California, if you're illegal, you can get a driver's license um, and you should be able to get a photo ID. It doesn't matter if you're illegal. That's how the Democrats think. And all they all reason for this is because this means to them that they're able to stay in power. They don't care about improving these people's lives. They don't care about even even improving our lives for that matter. They only care about themselves. That's just that's just if you look at it, that to me is the fact. And it's funny because even around where I live now, um, I think we are as much as this last time. That Trump got elected, elected. I think we are truly still a blue state of Pennsylvania. That's where I live. Because we have people who, you know, in the area I live, the surrounding area, it has been overpopulated with way too many homes. And um, by doing so, we have um, we have a lot more. Um, criminal acts taking place in in this state than we ever had before. And a a friend of mine said the other day, he lives up in Wilkesboro, and he said that about one out of every three license plates are from New York. And he actually talked to an older couple couple that lived, he lived in New York for about 10 years. He, He had a job up in New York. He moved back to this area. 
And he said he talked to somebody who lived around where he used to when he did live in New York ten years for 10 years. And he, he asked him, so why you why are you living around here now? Because they, they bought a house around here. And they said it's because the um, cost of living in Pennsylvania is much cheaper than in New York. And it's the same thing for New Jersey. But it's the same thing that we have with the refugees and um, the fugitives and these other people who are migrants who move to our country. These are people just like the same, but this is, you know, like in New York, that probably New Jersey and New York didn't want these people. Can you prove that? Well, not really. But they are moving here now because the cost of living is cheaper. But a lot of these people, I've heard this when I worked my last job, I've heard this for years, that the people that move next door who are from New York are very obnoxious and very loud and quite rude. And, you know, they have this sense of entitlement. Like they, they you know, hey, I and but they, they it's hard to explain because entitlement doesn't really tell you much, but it really is kind of how they think. They think like, well, you know, I can still act the way I did in New York when I lived in New York State. And if you're like a gruff and angry, you know, hostile person, you take all that that um, penned up anger and you move to a different area where we're not used to this kind of behavior and this um, being ruthless and angry and screaming and hollering. That's not the way Pennsylvania used to be. And now it's becoming like like New York was. Now, here's the other problem. And I've said this to friends. I've actually asked somebody um, from somebody who is a you know conservative person, um, very well known. I asked him, I said, listen, um, sorry about that. Do, do you think that, you know, because this person was originally from New York. He moved years ago into Pennsylvania. He lives upstate Pennsylvania. And I asked him, I said, do you think that there's a, a, a sleuth of more people that are coming from the blue states, the true blue states of New York and New Jersey, and moving here because they kept on voting Democrat for so many years that they basically drove themselves out of their states. And now they're moving here. But the thing is, I asked them, do you believe that by doing so, they're going to do the same thing here? They're going to vote Democrat, and eventually the cost of living in Pennsylvania is going to get ridiculously high, and we're not going to be able to live here anymore any longer either. And he basically agreed with me. He said this has already happened already, I guess. He, I thought he said California, where they're moving. People are moving because the cost of living out in California is just so ridic- ridiculously high. That they're moving from California now out to like tech places like Texas because they basically these people drove themselves out of their own state and it was their own doing that did it. It wasn't that, you know, oh, I, I like I said, hey, you should vote Democrat because that's a smart move. One thing I would never do that, but I'm just saying these people are so stupid. There's no other way to put it. They're so dumb, so naive, they don't realize. That you, um, these people um, had created this problem um, onto themselves. They don't see it as they're the problem. They see it as everyone around them as the problem. Not themselves, but everybody else. And again, they, they bring their negativity and their viewpoints that are very, um, like, like very clouded, um, like, and they they don't realize because I, I I can't put this into words correctly. They don't realize, hey, maybe if I change my mind frame or I change the way I think, and maybe if I try to vote, you know, for the you know somebody else that's outside my own party, you know, meaning which a lot of, a lot of people don't get me wrong. I think this last election, and this is why Trump won. The, you did have a lot of Democrats. They realized, wow, the cost of living and everything is really high. I haven't seen any changes. Um, I'm, I have been unable to find a decent job in years. I've been unemployed for X amount of years. 
And let me try to vote for Trump. And a lot of people did that. They changed parties from Democrat to Republican. So that's good. I don't have a problem with that. But I think there's still way too many people. Well, I heard it's a small percentage, but I'm just going by what I think it is. I'm only giving my opinion, but I think there's a lot of people out there who still think uh, very negatively against Trump. And they don't realize by keeping that viewpoint that it's not me, it's everybody else who's creating these problems. It's just going to continue. And, and, you know, they don't realize that. You know, I asked my friend the other day, I said, do you ever notice, like, you know, people don't stick, like, they want to change. Every four to eight years, we go back and forth on the parties. We go from Democrat to Republican and, you know, back to Republican, you know, Democrat to Republican, Republican back to Democrat. Like, people get tired when things even get better, because obviously they, I think they did during the Reagan years. Um, people seem to, for, you know, had forgotten that. And then who did you get? I think we did get Bush. I can't remember. You know, we did have uh, Bush Sr. and then we have Bush Jr. But honestly, it wasn't like a a straight line of like, OK, we had Republicans for the last 20 years. No, it's usually it's it, this the cycle usually goes for the eight years that we change parties, no matter how good things may be looking up. And, you know, you know, I hate to say this, you know, I think we I hope we get Trump for at least eight years. I don't know. I hope we get Pence for another eight years. That would be nice because that would definitely um, make a big change on the way things are running in our country, <coughs> and probably for the better, too. But I think people are going to get tired of it and say, well, you know what? Even though things are much better, I kind of want to see what happens if we vote Democrat again. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. You know, there could be some day that you get somebody who is on the Democratic Party who actually does think more... Um, more conservatively than 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 um did on the other side but i seriously doubt that will ever happen because honestly any person who would you know run for the democratic party and and thinks remotely conservative won't be uh won't be in that party for very long they might miraculously disappear um you know get in some type of tragic accident or they may just Honestly, we'll never get elected, Ele- you know, get to the point that they could get elected as president. So because um, personally, I think that's kind of what Trump Trump was always kind of like neither party for the longest time. And I thought he kind of, you know, which scared me for years before he even got elected. That, But I saw some uh, something Ken Matthews had on his show. He had a sound clip from when when Trump was only like, I think, 30 some years old. And he was being interviewed, and he even back then said, you know, he would, well, one thing, he said, I'd never run for president unless it was necessary. I I really don't want that job. But his ideas, because he's like 70 years old, so that was like 40 years ago. His ideas, surprisingly, were very conservative. But the, the thing is, though, with Trump, I have to say that he personally... Um, this is my opinion. I think he really doesn't want to take sides. You know, he's more, okay, I don't care if you're Republican. I don't care if you're Democrat. I want what's going to basically help my country. That's what he sounded like when he was in his 30s. Pretty much, by the way, the way he talks now is the way he talked 40 years ago. He wants to see things um, you know, see America strive and that people are, you know, you know, well off, not that they're dependent on on big government. So, yeah, so he always had that mind frame. And I wish I could remember that interview who who had, you know, was on some television show years ago. Again, he was it was like 40 years ago where he was being interviewed and what he wanted to see then 
and it never really panned out is what he's doing now. So that's that was pretty that was pretty interesting. So um sorry about that. I'm breathing heavy now. Yeah, I'm I'm running out of things to say. Honestly, I was really once again I really wanted to focus the show on you know, what I've learned from watching a TV show such as Xena, but I end up going to more a political strive and uh, a little off what I initially wanted to do. That is one of the reasons also that I mentioned, like, or I made that slogan for my show, Real Talk About Nothing. Because I really, one thing I, you know, I really don't talk about anything specifically. I don't have a focus on one subject. It goes wherever I feel like what I want to talk about. And obviously that, you know, as much as Xena had a very strong impact on, you know, on how I see things at this present time, who knows, I'll change my mind a a billion other times. But I think uh, Dinesh's film definitely had more of an impact. Of course, I I just had seen that like two days ago. Um, Speaking about Xena, though, one thing that was interesting, um, you know, and I, I mentioned this was this to a friend and I didn't get a response back is, you know, I get ridiculed by one other friend, a particular friend who constantly says, well, you know, oh, you're a, you're a misogynist. Like I hate women. I have no respect for women. Same thing like that that Trump constantly uh, gets derailed with. Well, you know what? I hate to tell you, but growing up, um, if it's entertainers, or other people that are government officials, um, people of history, generally the people I do admire the most, even teachers, professors, were all women. So how could I be such a person who is who hates women and uh, you know misogynist or disrespects women? When one thing is, I'm not a person who asks women out on dates or anything like that. I'm not a guy who hangs around the bars. That's one thing. That is one thing. But then there's the other side where most of the women that, I mean, most of the people I admire that are uh, in music, entertainment, government, and in history are all women. So that makes no sense to me. How can I be such a um, hateful person against females when yet more so than anybody else? It's almost like the Democratic Party where they say, oh, yeah, they say one thing, but then they present themselves in another way. Well, that's kind of like me, not directly because I really don't come across that way, but other people make me come across as though I don't like or disrespect women, which is, it's a total lie for one thing. Um, Because right now, actually, it was funny when I just finished the show Xena, which was, again, it was really good. It was based upon real people, actually, which was interesting. Um, One of the characters who I really liked, I didn't like the way she changed so much, this one particular character, I can't remember the actress's name, but the character's name was Gabrielle. That was Zena's best friend. Well, the way that character changed from day one, um, changed from a um, not sure of herself little girl to a woman who kind of followed, kind of followed the same footsteps, Gabrielle, the character, as Joan of Arc. So obviously... I would think that the character that this character of Gabrielle and Xena was based upon, because they did base the characters on real people. Even myth, if, if, if some of it was like based upon mythology, like, um, my, you know, mythological gods or, uh, you know, m- mythology meaning like fictional characters from Greek history, but other parts were based upon real facts, real people. Um, Julius Caesar was one. I mean, I learned so much from that show. You can learn a lot from any show. That was one thing I told a friend. 
Um, you learn about Greek mythology. You learned about Indian culture and their gods, which I never knew they existed, honestly. Um, Egyptian gods. Uh, you learn about gods in mythology, I think, on one of the shows. I think that was more Hercules, so. You learn about uh, mythology behind, you know, Ireland and their beliefs. So, yeah, I mean, that show really did bring a lot to the table. Now, yeah, it was fictional. And, you know, but you know what? Think about it. I was going to do a show. Now, I kind of ruined the way I did this show. But that's okay. That's okay because it's going to be about anything. But then when I thought about it, I was like, okay, what was the purpose back during uh, the high, you know, the the high tale of Greece in history. What what drove those people? What and where did where did people even um further forward in in our history with Shakespeare? Where did people get their news? Or you know, it was through entertainment. Believe it or not, like Greece, you know, they had plays like the Greek plays and stuff like that, that was just to basically a way of storytelling um, and explain things on what was going on in, in, in the news, but also how to explain things about, you know, um, religion and, and other beliefs. Now, Shakespeare, I understood, if you ever watched like Shakespeare when he was performing these plays, during that time, again, that's going forward in time, it was more than just, okay, we're going to watch a play on um, Hamlet, Othello, Othello, is it Othello? Um, no, um, I'm trying to think of some Shakespeare plays because I had to read all those in college years ago. Uh, Macbeth. Well, the long, like, especially Hamlet, there was more than just a storytelling of, you know, a son trying to get vengeance on his deceased father. It was also, it gave you um, kind of like a news, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. It gave you a little bit what was going on during that time. So it was more than just telling a story. So Xena is the same way. Um, and so was Hercules. You know, not the exact same way, but it, it basically, I'm, I'm getting some background um, people talking. But there was more to it than just, okay, this is just a fictional story. There's no truth behind Xena or Hercules. No, they're actually, they're making it entertaining, but at the same time, Without you knowing it, you're actually learning about history. Now, it's done with storytelling, but when, you know, from the earliest time of man, what did man, how did man um, pass history on? It wasn't through text, it was through telling stories. And these stories were passed on from one generation to the next. And these gener- these stories were like fictional stories either fairy tales or other stories, but incorporated or threaded in with these storytells, uh, st- these stories about, um, you know, mythological creatures or, or gods or anything like that. They were also trying to um, tell you about history and how the past, that's how history was passed on. Then eventually years later, obviously it was written down. It was, it was scripted. But, you know, what better way to get people to retain history than to make it into a form of entertainment back then? Now, this is my belief. I can't prove this, but I strongly, strongly believe this because I learned a lot from a show that was just supposed to be about entertaining a person, you know, entertaining the individual who was watching it. But yet then I learn about um, the history of China much more than I learned in a class I had in college. I learned about Greece, uh, Rome, and uh, different, um, what do you call it, uh, like um, 
like I said, Julius Caesar. Um, there were some other ones, too. So I kind of had taken it at a very fast pace. But, yeah, it was more than just, you know, being entertained from some show that was, you know, some goofy show. No, it was more than that. And I, I have to say that um, Sam Raimi and the other guy, I think his name is Tabert or something, Tabert. He's actually married to uh, uh, Lucy Lawless. You actually, um, you got a little bit of history in, in, in a way that it stuck with you. And if you wanted to find out the facts, you would go, I would go on the internet and I would like, look, okay, is this for real? Like what they're telling me in this episode of Xena or Hercules. So I would look it up online. It was like, wait a minute, there is some like real facts that were kind of, you know, threaded in again within, within the episode. So it wasn't completely all fantasy. It was based upon, um, you know, Greek history. Yeah, it was Greek mythology, but also also facts, things that really did happen. Um, so there was a couple places. The main one was the biggest one was definitely uh with Julius Caesar and how his um the people underneath of him. I can't remember their names. I apologize. Uh, how they um stabbed him. So I didn't know about any of that stuff, so I had to look it up, and it was like, wow, this was for real. This is not just telling some story and, and really fabricated it. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was fantasized a bit, but it also, it, you know, it kept um, a lot of the facts still intact. They just kind of put it in a way that people would want to listen to it or watch it and learn from it. So that that's what te- television, by the way, lacks nowadays. It really does because now it's it's basically okay. We don't want to tell you facts, even in a fictional way. We just want to tell you what we want you to believe. We want to brainwash you, and I mean the left. So I just I'm going back to that one too. So anyway, um, yeah, it was it was definitely um, it was a very good show. In fact, right now I'm watching something that was two years after the fact of when Lucy Lawless was done, uh, you know, on Xena. She actually did a um, a mini series on women of history, warrior women of history. So I watched the very first episode and it was on Joan of Arc. So that's what kind of made me like look back and look like when I was still watching the tail end of Xena, I was like, wow, you know what? I kind of see where they came up with these ideas for these characters on the show. Excuse me. They're based upon real people. Um, One thing about Xena, they also, they went one step further with like the Greek gods, uh, gods in China, um, the myths and beliefs in Ireland. They went way beyond that. And they actually went into um, heaven and hell. And St. Lucifer, when he first, before he fell as an angel, they go into, they change the character, um, they change Christ into a character named Eli, but it serves the same purpose. Eli was Christ in, in Xena. So they bring in, they, they, they uh, incorporate Christ into a television show that was supposed to be strictly entertaining you know, for entertainment purposes, but they bring in Christ. They bring in um, an angel, archangel named Michael. They bring in the archangel Lucifer, um, you know, and how Lucifer falls from the heavens to become, you know, the king of, of, um, of, of hell. So it was, it's very, very interesting. Um, I didn't know that, and I looked that up to make sure that was factual, but how it was, especially during um, Caesar's time, Julius Caesar, he crucified many of his his um, his enemies. Like the people who got captured, he crucified them. So I looked up that stuff. It's like, is this for real, or is this just being like something that's exaggerated? No, it's not exaggerated. So again, it was it's it's got a lot of information. Um, watching the 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 special, the first segment on uh, warrior women with with Lucy Lawless is just phenomenal. I mean, it's definitely if you have Amazon, it's free. If you have Amazon Prime, I should say, 
So I watched the first one. I think it's like 10 parts. And yeah, I would definitely I would recommend for anyone to watch it because that's not you can't say, oh, that's just fantasize and that's just something glorifying in the truth. No, it's not. It's actually it is very truthful. It's it's all about facts because I never really understood about Joan of Arc. She died at the age she was burned. At, she was burned alive at the age of 19. Um, she got. Um, the word from God, I guess, is the best way to put it at the age of I was either 13. I thought they said 13, but I think it was more 14 years old that she was, you know, she got the word from God, like um, what she needed to do. So from that span of 13, 14 years old for that five years, she changed history of France. She changed the history of France. Um, very, very good special. Again, if you have Amazon Prime, I would recommend it. Um, I'm going to end this show because it's at an hour. I'm surprised I was able to do this. And, folks, I hope you enjoyed this. And this is Walter from I, Walter. And, yeah, I'm going to sign off for now. So, yeah, um, let, you, let me know what you think. And hopefully I did a pretty good job. Okay. Have a good one, folks. This is, this is me signing off. <laughs>